Okay, well, good morning, everyone. And uh, before I introduce our distinguished lecturer this morning, I just want to remind you that we have this um, added uh, session in, in the program this afternoon at 2.15, from 2.15 to 3.45, uh, on Brexit. Uh, it'll be a, uh, an informal forum discussion, panel discussion, uh, with uh, Neil Walker, myself, Claire Kilpatrick, Bruno De Vitter, Giorgio Monti, Deirdre Curtin, and um, uh, I think Joanne Scott will join us as well. So uh, we thought it would be an, uh, useful and interesting to share some thoughts with you, but also particularly to hear what you have to what you have to say to hear your contributions well every year we have a uh, a distinguished lecture as part of this program and it's it's really great uh, to have to welcome back uh, Neil to give the lecture this year uh, Neil is 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 currently uh, the and I have to I have to look at this because it's such a long title but it's a, such a great title that I have, to, I have to read it out. The Regis Chair of Public Law and the Law of Nat Nature and Nations in the University of Edinburgh. I think that must be the best chair title anywhere in the world. <laughs> been living down to it for years. <laughs> um, before he joined Edinburgh or went back to Edinburgh as, as uh, Regis Professor, he, he was here uh, as Professor of European Law uh, between the year 2000 and 2008, and he was uh, Dean of Studies, among, among other things, uh, while he was here at the Institute. And before that, he, he taught, in fact, at the University of, of Edinburgh and also at the University of Aberdeen in Scotland. As you will, uh, I'm sure all of you have uh, know Neil Walker's work, if you don't know him personally. He works very much on constitutional theory, the constitutional dimension of, of uh, the way that legal orders are, are interconnected, uh, the state, the sub-state, regional and international legal orders. He's written on the EU constitution, on the nature of sovereignty, um, on the role of the state uh, in, the, in a, in a post-Westphalian world order, the mosaic of, of transnational power structures and constitutional authorities. Um, he's been one of the leading thinkers on, uh, in the field of or thinking about theories of constitutional pluralism. And in, in, in one of his uh, recent papers, um, I just found this little uh, quotation which I thought in a way sums up um, the work that, that you do, Neil. You said, it is difficult, and as the European supranational experiment enters a turbulent seventh decade, it becomes ever more difficult to imagine the EU as a legitimate legal and political construction other than by invoking the structures and values of constitutionalism. And I, I think that's a good summary of the work that you've been doing over the years. Since going back to Edinburgh uh, in 2008, uh, Neil Walk has been contributing also to, to very much to the public debate over um, Scottish independence, the constitutional position of Scotland within the European Union, and most recently, of course, um, to the Brexit debate. Um, so the title uh, of Neil's lecture for us today is, 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 is uh, a suggestive one, I think. He calls it the European Union Experiment, and I'm really looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Neil, over to you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank, thanks, Maurice, for that uh, very, very kind and generous uh, introduction. By the way, I, I hadn't realized until you said it that uh, I'm always on the wrong side of these public debates. You know, I was on the wrong side of the independence debate and I was on the wrong side of the Brexit debate. So, so uh, I hope for more success in the future. Uh, it's great to be back here. As, as, as uh, Professor Kimona said, I, I spent many years here as a, as a professor. Uh, the most enjoyable intellectual times of my, of my life. I've been back many times since, but it's a particular pleasure to be back here. Uh, I, I'm very honored to have received this, this, uh, this invitation. 
as I said, I've had some of my most interesting and stimulating uh, intellectual times in this room. When I was here as a professor, it was the, the time of the, uh, the Constitutional Convention between 2003 and 2005, and it's, it's hard not to see that as a very, very different time than the one we're living in now. Uh, it seemed to be a, a, a hopeful time, a time where the European Union had an embarrassment of choices about the way in which it, it went forward. Uh, and in these days, some people actually said that uh, uh, the time was not ripe uh, for a constitutional innovation, for a written constitution, because written constitutions only ever gain traction in times of crisis. You know, to which your response today should be, be careful what you wish for, you know, because uh, perhaps there did not seem to be any crisis in 2003 or 2005, but with the uh, financial crisis, the migration crisis, the security crisis, the Brexit crisis, etc., etc., then we have many, many uh, uh, different forms of crisis with which to uh, deal with today. Anyway, that's just an aside, and uh, delighted to be here. Let me say two things by way of, 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 of introduction. One is that uh, it's hard not to talk about Brexit at the moment, especially if you come from uh, the source of the evil. <laughs> it's hard not to, to talk about it, but I'll try my best. This, this paper was not written in the context of Brexit, but Brexit is a shadow which looms over it and over many other things. And I will come back to the, the Brexit dimension towards the end, uh, and certainly I'll be part of the discussion this afternoon. The second thing I would say by way of introduction is that, uh, uh, as is often in the digital age, I got my inspiration for this lecture through doing a very basic Google search, okay? I started coming across all these references to the EU as an experiment. And so I Googled, I spoke to Mr. Google and said, okay, what do you have to say about this? And waited for the deluge. And indeed there was a deluge of different ways of expressing the European Union as an experiment. And I'll say something about these at the end, except what I want to say at the beginning is that uh, two things. One is the way in which the language of, of the experiment is used is very, very diverse. There are very, very positive uses of the idea of an experiment, <coughs> a noble experiment, an audacious experiment, an experiment without precedent, a wonderful experiment, an experiment in civilization, etc., etc. But there's also very, lots and lots of negative connotations, a disappointing experiment, a Frankenstein-style experiment, a spe a, an experiment which uh, was bound to go wrong, etc., etc. I will come back to some of these different themes and these different ways of talking about it in due course. But they are very, very diverse. And one thing I would say, and which was already on my mind when I developed this lecture, is that the, the narrative of experimentalism, the narrative of the EU as an experiment, has become increasingly negative, increasingly pejorative, in recent years. So in the earlier period, the experimental discourse tended to be more affirmative and more positive. In more recent years, that's not been the case. And certainly in the context of the Brexit debate, uh, the use of the language of experiment was something which was used almost exclusively on the side of the leavers, the Eurosceptics, those who wanted to criticize the European project. So what I'm trying to do in this lecture and in a broader project that I'm trying to develop at the moment is to see what traction we can get from this idea of the EU as an experiment. What does it tell us about the deep meaning of the European Union? And what does it tell us about the trajectory of the European Union, the direction in which it's going uh, <coughs> today? Okay. It's... Uh, it's probably an overambitious project, and the various parts I can tell you in advance don't, don't, there, there are various open-ended elements in this, in this discussion, uh, and I very much look forward to your questions at the end, because they might help me firm up on some of the uh, ideas I'm trying to develop here. So it's not a polished lecture, it's a very open-ended lecture. You can probably tell already it's not a polished lecture, but uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's very open-ended. So let me start with just this basic idea of the <coughs> experimental method. Uh, 
What do we mean by the idea of the European Union as an experiment? The experiment of European Union. So, obviously, when we talk about the experimental method, we talk about the testing of a hypothesis, control over variables, careful measurement, establishment of cause and effect. It's very much a scientific method, and also, to some extent, a social scientific method. And often within the discourse of European Union, you get this idea of the European Union as a kind of living experiment or live experiment. It's an applied experiment. It's an experiment in which the practice and the experimentation take place simultaneously. It's a laboratory experiment in that sense. <clears throat> and what is the basic hypothesis? Well, we all know what the basic hypothesis of the European Union is. It's the idea that we can achieve more effective and legitimate government in and across European states, whatever these may be, through the addition of a supranational regulatory framework than we can through state-based regula regulatory frameworks alone. A very, very basic hypothesis. And within that, that covers a multitude of different possibilities. And it also covers a multitude of different uh, uh, hypotheses. So there's a general hypothesis, and within that, there's a number of more specific hypotheses which we'll find. Okay? And so the idea is that right from the beginning, the European Union is, 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 is predicated on the possibility that this, 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 this is a correct hypothesis. And it's not a categorical hypothesis. It's not a yes or no one. It's a more or less one. And again, that's also true from the beginning, from the outset. So <clears throat> what I want to talk about is the, what is the significance of this experimental idea, what I'm calling the experimental motif. And what, what, what I want to do is to say, if we think about the European Union in terms of experiment, that tells us, tells us something both about the, the, it tells us something both about the causes of the European project, the experimental dimension tells us something about causes. It also tells us something about the manifestations, the way in which the European project manifests itself, and it also tells us something about the consequences. So I want to start off with the causes, okay? And I want to try to explain why the origins of the European Union and the notion of experimentalism are so closely tied together, okay? And basically, what I'm saying is that there's there's, there's two or three underlying factors here which are important, and which I've just laid out here, and then I'll go into them in a little bit more depth. One is the, it's really just a reiteration of what I've already said, that the centrality of the pursuit and testing of various innovative, normative, institutional, and cultural hypotheses about the making of a transnational political community. These are things which are being tested all the time within the European Union. But there's also another factor which I'm talking about, the commitment to government, uh, sine ira e studio, without anger or bias. The, 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 the commitment to disinterested, experimentally based government, which is another deep underlying factor. Now, I have to explain these in far more depth. Okay. Uh, now, firstly, the innovative claims and hypothesis. So this is the, right from the beginning, the European Union has involve not just the hypothesis that supranational governance can work, but also within that, a whole bunch of more specific hypotheses about the nature of law, the nature of institutional design, and the nature of cultural possibilities within the European Union, okay? So let me start with the legal. And all of this is probably very, very self-evident to most of you, but uh, let me say something about it because it's, 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 it's something which is often forgotten. There's a famous article which was written by, actually it was written by both the present and the future president of the European University Institute, by Joseph Weiler and Reynold de Hus. They didn't know that they were going to be the president and, and the future president when they wrote it 25 years ago, where they actually say, they use the phrase that, uh, <coughs> that uh, law is both the agent and object of integration. It's one of these wonderfully suggestive phrases which you can't really tie down what it, what it really means, but it, you know it's getting at something which is really, really important about, about law within the European Union. So let, let me try to surmise what they meant and what is significant about this. So if you think about how we all think about law, our everyday theories of what law actually is, 
then we tend to think about law in one of two fundamentally different ways. We either think of it as, as a kind of instrument of political will, okay? But it's an instrument of political will which is usually underpinned by the coercive authority of the state. So we have inst an instrumental view of law, law as policy, but law as policy backed by force, backed by power in that sense. So that's one view of law we have. The other view of law is what you might call the, the kind of Hegelian view of law. The view of law which in, 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 in the German terms you think of it in terms of Sittlichkeit, the idea that law somehow represents and shadows a cultural way of life and its expression of a cultural way of life. Okay? So most of the ways in which we think about law in the modern age are precisely about these two, law as an instrument and law as an expression of an ethical way of life. And many of the debates about law are debates about the relationship between these two different ways of thinking about law. Okay. Now, what, what law does in the European Union is something very, very different from either of these things, but also, in a funny way, a kind of combination of the two. Because law is both an important agent within the European Union, in that instrumental sense, but it's also an important object, an important expression of what the European Union is. But in neither case, in neither case, is law in the European Union some kind of secondary variable? So if you think back to the instrumental view, law is a secondary variable behind force and political policy. Within the European Union, it doesn't have that same secondary meaning. It's a far more primary idea. But also in terms of the actual object, remember within this sickly kite metaphor, you already have a common way of life a common culture, a national culture, or whatever. And law is merely an expression and perhaps a reinforcement of that. Whereas many people, when they're summing up the objectives of the European Union, would see these as irreducibly legal objectives. They wouldn't see these legal objectives as somehow responding to some common ethical way of life. They would see these objectives as themselves part and parcel, a significant part and parcel of what the European Union is. So what the European Union does is it puts law very much, sorry, uh, front, front and centre within the European project. Is that better? Yeah. Was it, was it? Yeah, okay. It's uh, <laughs> fighting with the air conditioning here. It puts law front and centre within the European project and it gives it a very deep significance. Now, I don't have time to go through all the other ways in which uh, we have innovative hypotheses within the European Union, but certainly institutionally, I've simply used this term of the acephalous political system. Acephalous means without a head. It's a political system which, unlike every other constitutional system we know, doesn't have a driving force. It doesn't have a single driving force. It has a whole bunch of institutions which both vertically uh, both horizontally at the European level and vertically in the relationship between the U European and the national level, has no obvious head, has no obvious superior authority. So it's very much, I don't like using the term network, but it really is a network institution in that sense. It's an institutional complex which has no obvious head. Also culturally, I think it's important to try and uh, find out again, or just, just to remind ourselves of what is distinctive about the European Union. And again, maybe I can draw upon something which, which, uh, which Joseph Weiler once said, which I think was, 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 was insightful on this point, which is that normally when we think about the relationship between a political project and uh, <coughs> cultural identity, then we either see a relationship where there's a kind of nesting of different identities. So within the federal polity, we understand that in many ways to be Texan is somehow a lesser thing than to be American. Or Amer to be American is the, frame, is the framing idea. Or to be German is the framing political identity above being a member of a particular land. Or to be British perhaps is the framing identity above being part of one of the devolved 
states of Scotland or Northern Ireland or whatever. So we either have a nested sense of political culture or we have a sense of political culture as just simply being only contingently attached. So many people see themselves as being citizens of the world or cosmopolitans or this or that, or they see themselves involved in a project like feminism or uh, uh, disability rights or whatever it might be. But the relationship between that kind of political project and any national political project is a contingent one. One is not dependent upon, uh, upon the other. What we have within the European Union is this idea of a necessary interdependence, a necessary interdependence of the national political project and the supranational political project, but also a necessary, i.e. a non-contingent interdependence, which isn't nested. It's not one which says that somehow the higher identity is the prior and the organizing identity, and the other one is lesser. That's not the claim which has been made within the European Union. The claim is being made as one of necessary interdependence, without one identity necessarily being greater or higher than the other. So what I'm saying is that if you think of these as hypothetical claims, they're deeply complex claims. Of course they are, deeply complex claims. And they're ones which then have to be rolled out in terms of many, many more specific hypotheses. But there are audacious claims, and they are experimental claims. No one's ever claimed that before. And so the people who made the European Union are making really fundamental claims at the legal, at the institutional, and at the cultural level. Okay, <clears throat> now, I also want to make the point that, that the, the other part of the experimental motif coming from the background is a combination of what I would say ideological and, and strategic. And what I mean by that is that if you go, if you go back to the, the outset of the European Union, the way I've put it here is that the, the initial goals, peace and prosperity, and the stabilization of the supranational framework were treated as manifest and uncontentious. Okay? I'll, I'll, I'll quote uh, Joseph Weiler for one last, one, one last occasion here. He, uh, he, talks about the, uh, he talks about the messianic nature of the European Union, the sense in which, at the beginning, the European Union was seen as a savior the thing which saved the European continent from a half century of war and from all the social and political pathologies associated with that half century of war. And there was this messianic sort of saviour complex associated with it. I think that's somewhat overstated, but what I do think is certainly clear is that in, at the outset, the European Union gained a lot of its initial traction from this idea that it had manifest public goods at its heart. Uncontentious manifest public goods. Whether or not these were imbued with a messianic spirit is a different question, but it was certainly seen as being uncont uncontentious uh, uh, public goods. And a lot of people say, well, how does this fit with the cool, dispassionate, bureaucratic side of the European Union? Of course, it fits perfectly. If you actually have uncontentious pre-specified, agreed public goods, then all you're really concerned with, if you're so sure of the public goods, is the kind of instrumental rationality, the means associated with these, uh, 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 related to these ends. So the idea of the European Union as a messianic project, and the idea of the European Union as some kind of hotbed of cool, dispassionate, administrative rationality, they're not opposites they actually go together very, very closely in the history of the European Union and how we think about it. So there's a sense there in which, uh, wh wh why is this related to experimentalism? Well, again, it's related to experimentalism in the sense that, as is often the case with a scientific worldview, you know, the aim, the overall aim which you're trying to achieve is itself uncontentious. You know, and what is actually, you know, it's, what, are you, what you're really investigating are what are the ideal or what are the best means in order to achieve that particular end. So science is often predicated upon the uncontentious nature of the deep policy goals which are associated with it. Uh, whether it be 
improving the environment, whether it be uh, building a spacecraft which can go to the moon, whatever it might be, the actual policy itself is treated as something which is unproblematic. And all the hard work goes into the means end rationality. Well, in many cases, that's also true of the history of the European Union. Okay? <coughs> and what that also means, and I want to come back to this, is that later goals and the means associated with these goals should also be the responses to the discernment of evident need in the policy environment. I'll come back to what I mean by that in due course because it's actually very important. So there's an ideological dimension. So it's not just, it's not just the fact that the European Union is an experiment in some deep sense, it's trying to do something new. It's also the fact that it's, it's, it, it's, it has located its deep objectives in a way which then leaves it and actually forces it in a way or encourages it to use a very, very experimentalist methodology in order to achieve these ends. There's also something, though, uh, strategic about this because, remember, right from the outset, the European Union's project has taken place within the shadow of nationalism, within the shadow of the state, within the shadow of state, constitutional and other methods. And the European Union has always had a kind of ambivalent relationship to that. Okay? And so the part, of the part of the investment in a kind of experimentalist, scientific worldview has been precisely in order to distance itself from that kind of nationalist way of thinking. Both as a way of bringing to bear the arguments which can curb national self-interest, and also to avoid, and it doesn't, hasn't always avoided this successfully, but to avoid the sense that somehow the European Union is just some kind of poor imitation of the state. It's the state by lesser means. Because what the European Union is saying, and what the project of the European Union is saying, is that we're the state-based project has often been about the commitment to an existing good, the existing good of national unity. The European project has always been about the commitment to forward-looking, project-orientated government as a kind of as a, a antithesis, as an antidote to that sort of nationalist idea. Okay, uh, <coughs> right. So. The significance of the experimental motif. Now I want to say something more about the manifestations and consequences of this. And again, I'm just, I'll just start with a, a list of uh, what I want to talk about here. First of all, uh, the EU has what I call a meta-experiment, experiment experimental governance. Fancy word, I'll explain what it means in a moment. Okay? But also experimental forms and structures, experimentalism of purpose, and also this idea of an epistocracy, a rule of the wise and what the costs of that are. And then finally, I want to say something about the fragility that the European Union is now experiencing as, as a mature form of experimental governments. OK, so let me go through each of these. Right, OK. So now I need to uh, remind myself of the quote. Quite often, I've heard, I've seen the uh, the European Union compared people who are trying to uh, <clears throat> who are trying to compare the EU to a national project or a national constitutional project often go back to the the Federalist Papers, which were written by some of the founders of the American Constitution, and they were actually written in the late 1780s at the point where the American Constitution was founded. And perhaps the most famous phrase, the most famous sentence, which you'll find here is in Federalist One by Alexander Hamilton, where he says, it has been frequently remarked that it seems to, sorry, I need my glass. <laughs> it's, uh, I should know this off by heart, but I don't. Uh, so it has, it has been frequently remarked that it seems to have been reserved to the people of the country, of this country, by their conduct and example, to decide the important question, whether societies of men are really capable or not of establishing good government from reflection and choice, 
or whether they are forever destined to depend for their political constitutions on accident and force. Now that's, that's quite a claim. It's, you might say if you, wanted to, if you wanted to capture the essence of political modernity, you capture it in that claim. You know, do we live in a society of fate, where we're fated to do what we do for, by some metaphysical force which stands beyond us? Or do we make the world in our own terms? And can we do so through constitutional and other methods? So often I've seen an analogy drawn between that and some of the founding statements of the European Union, the Schuman Declaration, etc., etc., that same kind of commitment to rationalism. So the famous line in the Schuman Declaration, you know, Europe will be made not all at once or according to a single plan. It will be built step by step through concrete achievements which first create a de facto so solid, oops, solidarity. Excuse me. Now, the point... I would make here is that the, there's actually a huge difference between the Philadelphian method of constitutionalism and let's call it the Monet method because it was after Jean Monnet really that the, 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 the ideas of the, the, the Schumann Declaration were, were developed. Because what we have in the Philadelphian method is an experiment in government by prior design. The whole idea is that you set out the whole framework of government in advance. And the experiment is simply in whether the very idea of designed government actually works. Whereas the money method is, and why it's why we call it meta-experimentalism, is it's an experiment in government by open-ended experiment. What it's saying is, can we actually, can we actually govern our own affairs in that controlled way that we first put to the test at Philadelphia, but can we do it not through prior and final design, but can we do it through some open-ended notion of experimentation? So it's an experiment in government by open-ended experiment. And remember, what I mean by that is simply the idea that uh, we have a wish to govern supranationally. There's a plan, there's a project to govern supranationally. But part of that plan is precisely an awareness of the, uh, the need to be open-ended in how we structure this over time, to treat this as a continuous, evolving plan. So it's a different type of commitment. It's a different type of gambit. So gambit number one at Philadelphia is that we can run things if we have a plan. Gambit number two at the European Union is we can run things even if we don't have a final plan. We can run things provided we are actually committed to the idea of running things experimentally and developing things step by step and finding a way of doing so in response to changing circumstances. So this is why I think of, this is one of the, the really deep senses of the European Union as uh, an experimental idea. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Now, let, let me now uh, say something about some of the more detailed aspects of, of experimentalism. And so I apologize. I, what I'm doing here is very much just uh, dealing with uh, uh, some very, very basic ideas. But just to, what I'm trying to do here is to is to just reinforce that sense of innovation, of experimentalism, and how it suffuses, how it uh, uh, informs every aspect of the European Union project. We all have our pet ways of thinking about experimentalism and how it works in different parts of the European Union and how it works in different ways. I'm making a broader claim. I'm saying that somehow it's there, it's present in just about every aspect of thinking about the European Union. Of course, once you start looking for things, you always find it, so I'm aware of this, but uh, uh, let me, let me let, indulge me for a moment here. So part of this is actually, to begin with, normative. The very idea of non-hierarchical normative ordering. Right? You know, we, 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 have, we have so many examples of this within the European Union, and they're, they're all novel. They're all novel ideas. So the idea of a necessary form of dual or additional citizenship which was, which was introduced at the Treaty of Maastricht. 
There's no other constitutional project in the world which demands dual citizenship. So that would be one. The other, the idea of the, the splitting of the atom of sovereignty, the way in which that is done, not necessarily in the treaties, but in the very early case law from Van Henden Laws onwards, the very idea that some sovereign rights are taken to, are delegated to, are acquired by the supranational level. So this absolute, indivisible, indissoluble idea of sovereignty, somehow the atom of that is split within the European Union. Or even take something like uh, <coughs> the uh, Article 4 of the Treaty on European Union on sincere cooperation. The very idea that you would constitutionalize the idea of sincere cooperation between diff two different polities, between the states and between the supranational level, again is something which is very innovative, which is very new. And so what you have in all of these are, and there's many, many other techniques. We could talk about proportionality. We could talk about uh, uh, preliminary references. Many other ways in which we see non-hierarchical bridging mechanisms, normative bridging mechanisms within the EU in a way which has no, uh, has no precedent. People often try to argue there are precedents, but there are never clear and direct precedents. Often there are sources, inspirational ideas within national constitutions, but this notion of non-hierarchical normative ordering between different aspects of the same polity is something which is very, very new and very specific to the European Union. Secondly, there's what I call non-uniform structural integrity. And all I mean by that is that whole process of differentiated integration of uh, <coughs> a Europe which doesn't, isn't predicated on a notion of a uniformity of application of a single rule of law to all aspects of it. Now, as you know, and certainly in the context of Brexit, this has been reinforced. There's a long-standing argument about uh, how far we can take this notion of non-uniform structural integrity, how many opt-outs any country can have, to what extent uh, opt-outs from economic and monetary union can be permanent rather than temporary. We also have opt-outs in Schengen. We have systems of enhanced cooperation for those countries which want to go faster in different areas. But regardless of all of that, what is certainly clear is that there is no other polity which has experimented with the idea of non-uniform structural integrity in the way that the European Union has. Also true of what I call indeterminate territorial enlargement. We have, at the last count, had six waves of enlargement within the European Union, and at the moment we have six candidate countries. And the only, apart from the specific substantive normative criteria that new countries have to meet in terms of the rule of law, etc., etc., the only other thing that they have to meet is Europeanness. They have to be European states. But as we know, that's also a very, very open-ended idea. So the very notion of indeterminate territorial enlargement, with the possible exception of the United States, and we can argue about the ways in which this is different or similar, there's no other entity which has historically been so open, so experimentally open to the idea of the massive expansion of itself to a form and to a degree which would be unrecognizable from its initial form as a European Union. <clears throat> Clearly also uh, institutional innovation. And, and here, you know, I could draw upon all sorts of examples such as uh, the way in which the European Council was first introduced informally in 1975 and it wasn't given treaty status until 1992. Uh, common foreign uh, uh, policy was introduced again in 1992 but following many, many years of informal European political cooperation. Justice and Home Affairs was introduced at the same time but following many years of the Trevi informal organisation. These are all examples of experimental road testing of institutional projects. In these cases, interesting examples because the reality and the practice actually long preceded their uh, reduction to uh, treaty terms. So again, what you get is a form of experimentalism there. Uh, <coughs> revisable organizational forms. The very fact you know, that the European Union uh, uh, has itself, even in its basic organizational form, changed over the years. It starts off as a conglomerate of 
three entities, the economic community, the coal and steel community, the atomic energy community, it becomes the EC, it's joined by the EU, the EU then absorbs the EC. But we, again, we see with the introduction of new international treaties in recent years, dealing specifically with the Euro countries, just as we got the absorption of the uh, EU into something which looked like a single institutional legal entity, it begins to fall apart again in different sorts of ways. So again, there's a constant renewal of the, uh, what the ideal organisational form of the European Union is, which in some ways is a puzzle. Because remember what I said, that if the European Union is anything, it's a legal entity. And the very idea that the very legal substructure, the legal foundations of that entity are in constant change and constant movement is itself interesting, is itself indicative of this experimental dimension. Also evolving what we might call sectoral methodologies. For many years we had the three pillars. You know, we had the internal market and community pillar. We had the pillar of justice and home affairs and common defence uh, and foreign policy. Completely different institutional methodologies in terms of how you make norms, how you develop them, how you apply them, how you adjudicate upon them, if you adjudicate upon them. So again, a constant Europe of bits and pieces from many years ago, a constant evolution. So uh, we have this innovative forms and structures. Now moving on, we also have uh, experimentalism of purpose. And again, this is, this, is, uh, this is very, very significant. So we have a, a general functional extension. There's a recent book by uh, 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 a Finnish scholar, uh, Carlo Torre, uh, who talks about the sectoral constitutions of Europe. It's actually a very interesting book because what he says is that, you know, rather than thinking of Europe necessarily as, as one project, one grand abstract project, which is gradually filled in, if we think of it in terms of its functional extensions, then what we actually do is that we move from what he calls the original microeconomic constitution, which is a constitution of the four freedoms, competition, law, etc., etc., to a social constitution, which is the counterpart to that, the extent to which the uh, European Union gets involved in positive integration and in social policy, employment policy, etc., etc., as a counterpoint to that. The security constitution, both pre and after 9-11. And now, of course, after the fiscal crisis, and with the maturity of economic and monetary union, the idea of a macroeconomic constitution where Europe begins to struggle with the question of whether it can be seen as a supranational fiscal authority as well. So what we have there, there is a general question of functional ex extension, but at every point there is something experimental about this. These things are not done confidently, they're done incrementally, they're done cautiously, they're done in a way where you're, the, 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 the perimeters and the limits of what's been done is always being tested. And then of course, and this is of course an area where experimentalism is very, very much used within the discourse and there, there are so many experts on this in this room that I'm not going to talk very much about it, but the, within various sectors We've had, over the years, new methods of governance which are often imagined precisely in experimental terms. So if you move to this sort of micro area, and you move away from the broad purposes, and you actually look within each of the sectors themselves, then what we've seen almost from the outset of the European Union is a movement away from the classic community method of uh, the Commission proposing and the Council and the Parliament disposing to all sorts of different ways and more experimental, more open-ended, more reflexive ways of making law. So we know that historically through notions such as uh, 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 what someone once called, what is it, uh, new old governance, with things like comitology uh, and uh, other ways in which we used structures below the lawmaker to actually develop lawmaking, but in a way which was more consultative, which was more open-ended. But increasingly, with new methods of governance, uh, such as 
partnerships, uh, <coughs> and such as the open method of coordination in areas of economic policy, social inclusion policy, pensions, etc., etc. We actually have the development of an explicitly experimentalist method of making policy at the micro level, where the very idea of policy making and policy application as being different aspects, as uh, different things, is lost. Policy is something which is cyclical and iterative rather than something which is linear and final. And that's something, again, which is fundamental to the European Union. And it always has been, right from the beginning. We often overstate the extent to which new methods of governance are new. Right from the beginning, there has been a restless movement away from this linear model of lawmaking or policy making within the European Union. <coughs> so, uh, okay, now, what I want to say, and uh, I've, I will only detain you for another few minutes. Should speak till about half past, is that okay? Yeah, okay. What, 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 having said all of these things, having given a kind of brief picture of all of these different sort of experimental dimensions. I also want to say something about this, this idea of uh, epistocracy, which, uh, which, uh, which keeps coming up in, in the discussions which uh, I've been looking at at this issue. Now, what we, what we, what we mean by epistocracy is simply this idea of the rule, the rule of the knowledgeable, the rule of the wise, the rule of those who know. So if we go back to our ancient Greeks, Plato, of course, had the, the most ideal form of this, the, the philosopher king. Uh, Aristotle had a lesser notion of it. He came closer to the notion that in certain dimensions of policy, there was room for epistocracy, that is, rule not on the basis of military might or dynastic authority or even democracy, but rule on the basis of knowledge, this notion of epistocracy. Okay? Now, one of the points that I'm trying to make here is that everything in the background to the European Union, all of these background factors and all of these manifestations, they're not innocent. They, ha they, they create a certain sort of uh, cultural effect. And that cultural effect is something we have to be aware of. And so one of the terms I use here is, is scientism, which is uh, often, often, uh, often within ethical thought, uh, a distinction is made between uh, science and belief. You know, either you do things out of a conviction, a belief, a faith, which isn't grounded in evidence, or you do things on the basis of uh, knowledge, information, which is based upon cool, calculated evidence, the experimental method. Okay? And often that's treated as a kind of dichotomy. But of course, it's not a dichotomy, because the whole notion of scientism is one which says that it's often the case that people who believe in science become, in a sense, overcommitted to the scientific ideal. You, know, you only need to look at the way in which uh, uh, Discussions between uh, uh, <coughs> discussions over faith between certain types of uh, uh, anti-faith based uh, scientists and faith based Christians and, and followers of our faith you'll need to look at these debates to see the extent to which there's a symmetry of dogma on either side or there can be a symmetry of dogma on either side so the point is that Sci scientism itself can lead to an un, an, an un itself is based upon the idea that we create value in the world simply through looking at the evidence through the experimental method, nothing which cannot be measured, nothing which cannot be reducible to an experiment is a worthwhile idea or a worthwhile project. Okay. So there's that sense in which scientism can become locked into its own kind of dogma. Okay. So that's something which we have to be aware of if we're looking at any process, and certainly a process such as the European Union. There's also an elitism associated with that, that uh, uh, again, if you look at the ways in which different political projects are developed, uh, there's always a self-reinforcing element. If a political project is based upon uh, military might, then if people disagree with you, then you impose the military might upon them. If a political project is based upon uh, 
is based upon uh, uh, is based upon democracy, then if the people disagree, then you ask them again. There's always something reinforcing about the basis upon the basis upon which a particular political project takes place. Or if a political project is based upon some sort of dynastic notion of authority, then you reinforce it by trying to reinforce the sense of the leader as being some kind of charismatic leader. Well, if a political project is based upon knowledge, then I would, I would argue that there is something arguably just as sinister, something just as dangerous here. Because it's based upon knowledge, then you always start from the basis, basis that the knowledgeable people know better. And they are the people that you can rely on for that particular political project. So there is something about an elitism, a scientism, a kind of dogmatism of experimentalism, which is associated with the European Union as well. Now, again, and I'm, I'm going too fast here just to make in very, very crude terms some points that you know in more detail. One of the costs of this kind of approach is, well, there's two sorts of costs. One is a sort of national instrumentalism. One of the things that was very, very clear, say, within the Brexit debate was uh, how, how little anyone could actually make an argument for the European Union in other than means end instrumental terms, in terms of very, very specific forms of interest. And quite sometimes people who were on the European side saying, why can't someone make a more ca passionate case for the European Union, for the European project? But the problem is, the European project has often justified itself, not in terms of general passionate commitment to any specific goals, but just in terms of its rational capacity to deal with particular problems in ways which serve the interests of a variety of different constituencies. So when you're faced with a question which is asking you to look at the European Union holistically, not in terms of a set of specific interests, it can be very, very difficult to make that argument. So it's a kind of national instrumentalism, which was very, very obvious in the British debate, but it's also obvious in the other national debates across the European Union as well. There's also, I think, a kind of disengagement, objectification, and passive consumerism at the individual level. Many people have you know, bemoaned the fact that the way in which we think about rights within the European Union is one which is very, very individual-centred. It doesn't speak to passion, it doesn't speak to collective beliefs, etc., etc. But again, I would say that if you have an elite, evidence-based, experimental project, if you have something which is based upon rationality, upon means-end instrumentalism, then it's very, very easy, it's perhaps too easy for people to begin to think of that in objective, alienated terms. What has the European Union ever done for me? The European Union is something which takes place elsewhere. It's not something that people are part of. So that kind of alienation that people have from a European Union, which is often measured in Eurobarometers as some sort of measure of failure, to me, in some ways, it actually just, it just crystallizes the existential condition of the European Union, because people People are encouraged to think of the European Union as, a, as a, a, an output machine, something which, something which produces certain results, which they can measure against their particular satisfaction needs, etc., etc. Okay, so let me uh, come to uh, some conclusions. Right. So basically, and this is a very, very tentative conclusion, if you... If you buy into my argument at all, okay, and you don't have to, if you buy into my argument at all, then this idea of the centrality of the experimental idea, or the experimental notion to the European Union, uh, it, it tells us something interesting, but also to some extent worrying about the European Union, okay? So we have this original pioneering momentum you know, the manifest goals, the messianic dimension, if it is that, but certainly the certainty, the certainty that there are certain basic objectives which are to be pursued. So that original experimentalism is an experimentalism about how do we achieve, how do we 
How do we find the promised land? We, we know that it's there. We just don't know how to get there. And it's bloody difficult. And we have to work out, we have to do funny things with law, with institutions, with culture. But there are things, they're audacious, they're worth doing because the objective is worthwhile. Then that whole experimentist philosophy moves on to a second wave where the European Union develops beyond that. It takes on, often in response to problems with its first wave project, it takes on other projects in the security area, in the social area, etc., etc., in the macroeconomic area. And it tries to use that same experimental philosophy. It tries to treat itself in that second wave as simply responding to problems as they arrive and having this open-ended uh, experimental approach to, uh, to, to answering these sorts of problems. Now, let me say in a moment what can maybe go wrong with that, but part of the problem is that if you use this experimental idea, then it does make you vulnerable. And here I bring back some of the comments I see within the, uh, the Brexit debate and within other debates, not just the Brexit debate, other debates over the last five or six years about the EU's economic crisis, etc. And these are ways of thinking about the experiment, okay? So one is what I would call the kind of categorically negative judgment. This is an experiment which failed. If you live by the sword, right, and you say this is about an experiment, well, you know something, we think it failed. It didn't actually work. This idea, so much of the discussion that you get from Eurosceptics is about the hubristic nature of this failed experiment, this experiment which simply didn't work, okay? Now, the second idea is what I call the sense of an ending, that somehow this is a redundant or an exhausted experiment, right? So quite often in the Brexit debate, people would say, you know something, I would have signed up for the European Union 20 or 30 years ago. That was okay, when it was about the single market. That was the experiment. That was a stage one experiment, and that was achieved, and that's fine. But that's, in a sense, it loses its traction beyond that. And related to that, there's a notion of the exhausted paradigm, the idea that somehow it's still flailing around looking for new experimental objectives, etc., etc., but actually it's lost that initial momentum and it can't regain it. Then there's a much more critical one, I say the Frankenstein one. So the, uh, the esteemed Michael Gove, for example, I've managed to quote, he of Eurosceptic fame in the UK, I managed to quote, find at least eight quotes where he likened the European Union to a Frankenstein, okay? This idea of this malevolent, this malevolent uh, project which, uh, which, uh, which loses control of itself, which does, which is a failure, which should consider itself redundant or exhausted, but somehow it staggers on. <laughs> it staggers on, it finds a way of staggering on because it has this epistocratic arrogance at its center, okay? So you have this idea as well. And that's, that's a very, very strong idea, certainly in the British debate, a very, very strong, a very powerful idea. Not everyone uses the Frankenstein metaphor, but that's, that's what they're thinking of. Then there's actually, just, just to, to add a slightly more subtle approach, there's a kind of dilution and fragmentation approach where a lot of people say, well, you know, that's, not, that's, that's all a little bit unfair, but actually, We've gone beyond the grand experiment of European Union. And what we have, what we're left in now is a series of sectoral experiments. You know, maybe, maybe we're moving towards a separate defense union, a separate security union, a separate economic union, and maybe pitched in a more modest way, we can think of these as a series of ongoing experiments. So the big experiment is over, but there's a number of spillover, spillover experiments, and these can continue to take place within particular sectors. So that's, these, are, these are different ways of thinking about that. So let me say something uh, in the end about this and where I think this, this leaves us. So I have this notion of, of fragility and maturity, right? This notion that in its, there's something paradoxical about the European Union as a polity. It's become more fragile in its maturity. And I think its fragility in maturity has something, quite a lot to do with this experimental idea which is at its center. So <clears throat> the, there's a sense in which the very unsettled nature of the European Union, the various ways in which I talked about it as being constantly on the experimental move, 
means that any effort at consolidation of the European Union tends not to ring true. Okay? One of the reasons why the constitutional project failed a decade ago, a decade and a half ago now, was that a lot of the people who were behind it, people like Joska Fischer, who was the German foreign minister who talked about the finality of the European project, that's it, we're done. We're a normal polity now. In many ways, it just stood against the evidence. It stood against the evidence of a polity which had already remade itself in four treaties in the previous decade. And the idea that somehow you could just call the end did not seem believable. Because there's something about, people used to call it the bicycle theory of supranationalism. There's something about that experimental project where it cannot stand still. And consolidation actually isn't something which can be easily understood in these terms. You know, a consolidation is, 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 is a kind of clotting. It's something negative. It's not something which can be easily thought of. But what are the options? The options beyond that, the problem is that the European Union now is kind of caught on a cleft stick between two different elements of what I would see if it's experimentalist philosophy. One is the continuation of a more expert-centered output legitimacy where you continue to try to legitimate the European Union in terms of its relentless pursuit of new projects, new problems, solving these problems in its own experimental way, or a more democratic response of input legitimacy, where you don't, you don't give up on the experimental idea, but you, you, you link the experimental idea much more clearly, as we already see in various micro areas of new governance, etc. You link it much more <coughs> clearly to a democratic project. And the problem with these is that both of them, so the standstill option doesn't work easily, but both of these, both the output legitimacy and input legitimacy project, both of these provoke Eurosceptic reactions, either against further elitist presumption, epistocratic arrogance, or against federalist overambition. So there's that sense in which, if you look at the crude critiques from the Brexit debate, what you actually see are uh, evidence or traces of a deeper sense of difficulty and a deeper sense of malaise associated with the European project. And maybe it's just because I'm feeling depressed after the Brexit debate, but you know, today at least, I don't see, uh, I'm not trying to be a Cassandra or a nihilist, I'm really not. But in terms of any easy solution to the legitimacy problems of the European Union, I don't see them very easily. One of the things I say at the end is that we may, instead, we may instead involve more differentiation. I can't imagine a European Union in 20 years' time which doesn't look quite significantly different structurally from the one that we have today. I think the renewal of a less Eurosceptic core Europe post-Brexit, where people are still more enthused with the experimental idea which is at the centre of the European Union, or perhaps a more complex form of variable geometry with the partial fragmentation of the EU into a number of sector-specific projects. What institutional form that will take, it can't be clear. But what I'm saying is I think the original experimental idea of the European Union has, hasn't necessarily come to an end, but it's come to a point, it's come to a point of crisis which cannot be reduced to the Brexit crisis or to any of the other crises we have talked about. It's really just a crisis of using that kind of experimental problem-solving methodology at such an increasing scale that it's bound to raise issues of the legitimacy of the overall project. But I think on that somewhat pessimistic note, I'll leave it at that at the moment. Thank you. Thanks. Very much indeed, Neil. Um, well, we have got uh, about 20 minutes or so uh, for, uh, for questions, discussion. So let me open the floor in the back. You'll have to shout to make yourself heard a bit. Okay, well, thank you very much for a very challenging, stimulating, interesting presentation. I have to, um, I'm sorry, I'm shouting because I'm so shouting. Yeah, um, <laughs> that's I good. Have yeah. To say that 
sold by your um, associations with experiment on the one hand and scientism on the other hand. Now, the experiment um, I see problematic because experiment supposes something that you try and if it does not work, you try something else. Well, in the European Union, we, this is not open in the law because the treaties are difficult to change. In the beginning, we did not even have a provision on leaving the European Union at all. So, um, as an experiment, I'm not sure it is a very open ended experiment that allows you to change and adjust to the failures and improve in that sense. Um, in terms of scientism, it's, it's probably even a more a problem because science, science presupposes two factors, two phases, and two types of knowledge that are necessary in order to advance science, knowledge and ability. So one thing is to design an experiment and draw conclusions from the experiment. And this is what I would term as theoretical. And the other thing is... What, what's the first one, sorry? You turn the uh, theoretical. Oh, right, okay, theoretical. Yep. Yes. Yeah? Okay. And the other thing is making the experiment, and this is the practical. So when you talk about elitism, um, I, I understand it as technocratic governance. This is a very practice based. It is not based on knowledge in the sense that you know we have two types of knowledge. I can learn something by heart as a monkey, and I will know it like when I prepare for my high school exams. And there is another type of knowledge which involves a certain level of IQ that allows you to advance science. Mm -hmm. So uh, what we are observing, to my mind, is the lack of scientism, because we only have the middle part, uh, the technocratic knowledge uh, to make an experiment. But what we seem to be lacking, what we have in the initial stage, seems to me, of the design of the European Union, and what is lacking today, is the ability to design the experiment and to draw conclusions from it. Would you, would you how would you reply to this criticism now, <laughs> I think I'll just go and lie down. But uh, <laughs> I think, uh, okay, very quickly, very good points, right? Let, let, let me say, I, I, don't, I don't want to take up all the time this morning to these because other people will want to ask questions. What I would say is, yeah, I mean, precisely, there's something about the European Union experimentalism which is only open-ended up to a point. Of course it is. It is only open-ended up to a point. And that's part of what I was trying to argue, that, 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 that science, science Science always works on the basis of certain uh, uh, beliefs which are not tested. There are certain grounded beliefs that you know it, it would be a good thing if we could achieve this end. So let us now try to work out how we would achieve this end. We don't question where it would be a good thing to achieve that end in the first place. So part of my point was that that kind of scientific outlook is actually can be sometimes dangerous because it it hides its own dogma, right? And that's there. Now, you can see that in terms of the treaties, but you can also see it in terms of the, the overall structure and the overall culture of the European Union as well. Now, in terms of the scientific method, obviously, I, had, I didn't have time to go into this in more depth. If I'd gone into it in more depth, I said, to what extent does the scientific method actually roll over to social science? Okay? We're, not dealing, we're not dealing with hard science. We're not dealing with a laboratory which is out there. In social science, the laboratory is us. Okay, And there's different ways in which we can do social science which involve observation with you then actually taking the results to a different context. But you can also have live experiments where the observation and the testing of the hypothesis take place at the same time. Now, you might call that a corruption of science, right? But my point is it belongs, at least it bears a family res resemblance to science, and it is trying to use some of the same scientific methods, however poorly and however much a poor imitation of it. Yeah? In the in back, yeah. Oliver. Uh, thank you very much for the very interesting lecture. Thank you very much for a very interesting lecture. Um, I had a question about this idea of a less Eurosceptic core Europe. And I've seen the idea proposed um, of almost like concentric circles of having more European states at the center, uh, more deeper cooperation, and then states who are less engaged. But I was wondering if there's any scope for that idea of a core Europe not to have to be predicated on certain states. 
So I think we could argue now that you have citizens who may identify more as Europeans and they're not necessarily concentrated in particular states. So do you think there's any scope for citizens who wish to have a core Europe to constitute themselves in some form of uh, structure? So what you really mean is, can I keep my passport even if Britain leaves? Yeah. <laughs> On a very practical level, yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's a very personal question. Uh, I, I, that's, 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 look, it's an interesting question, at least in, in many ways, but uh, in one sense in that uh, the, it shows the, the extent of creative thinking which actually goes on around the project of differentiated integration. You know, the, the, uh, I mean, core Europe ideas go back a long, long way. And uh, what you find is that within that debate, there's always a cycle where some people believe in core Europe, second class Europe. Some people believe that it's just about catch up, it's different speed Europe. And some people believe in a more radical form of differentiated integration. You know, and, the, and one, of the, one of the problems with Brexit, one of the really obvious problems with Brexit, is, is that in many areas of integration, Britain are certainly right at the center of it. They're right at the center of it. And, and uh, in other areas, clearly, uh, Schengen and the, uh, the Euro, they're not. They're very, very much to the side. But there's no, there's no, there's no singular trend. You, know, you find very, very much, you know, it's much more complex than that. It's one of the reasons why uh, uh, the idea of being in or out is such a crudely dichotomous way of thinking about something which is such a, a graduated set of possibilities. Whether we can extend that graduated set of possibilities further so that citizens can become decoupled from the state, I actually think not. And I think it has to do with what I said earlier about the way in which European identity cannot be seen as an equivalent to or a substitute or a larger form of a national identity. It's yin and yang. You need both. You need the supranational and the national identity together. So if someone has the, the orphan of the European identity without the national identity, I just don't, that doesn't compute to me. I don't know how that works, how that makes sense. Thank you very much for the interesting lecture. Uh, I would like to ask you two questions. Uh, first of all, uh, what are the similarities and the differences uh, between the American conception of federalism and the European one, and whether Europe can um, gain some things from uh, the lessons of the history of uh, American federalism? Because I think that um, in the notion of federalism, like the one that uh, Jacques Delors used, Federation of Nation States, less the idea of how to combine unity uh, with diversity and with protecting the autonomy of the states. And secondly, uh, whether the, law, the role of uh, the law in the European law, uh, in the European law has, um, what is its relation with perhaps um, a notion of community of law? like um, Walter Holstein used to um, use. Th thank you. Thank you, Johannes. <laughs> it's nice to see someone from my, from my Edinburgh past as well as my Florence past. So uh, the, uh, I think, look, federalism is, there's, there's, there's a whole bunch of political ideas out there which we, relate to the state, and federalism is clearly one of them, right? Now clearly, uh, if you look at the, the origins, the etymology of the federal idea, fides, the idea of faith, unity, relationship between different parts, it predates the state. And so those federal scholars who say, federalism isn't about the state, we can think of federalism in a non-state way, of course at some theoretical level, they're correct, and that's true. But I do think that there, there tends to be a slippage between that kind of claim and then an attempt to say, ergo, therefore, you can look at the American model and to some extent transpose it onto the European model. I don't think you can. Uh, I think that the, uh, the way in which we think about identity, the identity of political communities is very, very different within a federal state 
you know, where at the end of the day, you know, the federal identity is the framing identity, with the possible exception of Switzerland. It's the framing identity, and the other identity is something which fits in and is constrained by that frame. I don't think that's true within the European Union. You know. Now, if we, if we talk about unity and diversity, or very, very broad terms such as that, then yes, the European Union is an example of federalism, but in a deeply question-begging way. It simply says, OK, that's what we have. We have that idea of, uh, <coughs> of shared and separate power, of unity and diversity. But that's a very, very abstract notion of similarity. And I think often people are too quick to see the analogies with the United States. Uh, uh, so, I guess you know we <laughs> we can't learn that much from the United States. And I I spend more of my time trying to argue against people who think we can than trying to advocate that we do. So I think that's telling. I think there's an awful lot of people out there, particularly American scholars, who assume that's the case and who often quite impatiently assume that that's the case. Yes. Uh, that Thank you, Neil. Um, this was really interesting, and I think that the um, experimental approach makes um, explains many things in the political evolution of the EU. Your, your list of manifestations of experimental uh, ideas is, is makes sense of many other things that happened. But it's also a, a metaphor, experimentalism, because once you, you don't use it in a scientific context but apply it to a political phenomenon, it becomes different. And since it's a metaphor, one has to be careful on, on transposing too many things from the origins. No? And, and so I think one point where I was less convinced is where you say one of the manifestations of this is epistocracy. Because it's experimentalist, the scientists, in the broad sense of the term, are in charge. Is that really so? So if you look at, at the other manifestations that you listed, you know, um, ongoing institutional variation, um, indeterminate territorial extension, uh, experimentation with the organizational frameworks, all these things have been led by the political elites. It's still an elitist project, you could say, but it's not the scientists, it's not the epistocrats who've decided all these things. Each time it's been the political institutions and centrally the member states, the member state governments who made those choices on an ongoing basis. So I'm not sure whether the the sort of metaphor of experimentalism can extend to the point of saying, and therefore, because it's an experiment, and therefore it's the scientists who decide how things move forward. So thank you, Bruno, for reminding me that I overstated my case. <laughs> Not for the first time. Uh, the, uh, I, okay. I don't, I don't think, although this has been taped, so it's a matter of proof, I don't know, I think if I ever actually said that the scientists are leading the project. Uh, I think I, I use the term scientism. I use the term technocratic rationality. And uh, I guess what, what, what one can have a, a culture of evidence-led, problem-led, project-led government, right? Which changes the political culture without necessarily giving all the power to the, uh, to the scientists. So if we think about the enlargement project, uh, now, I mean, the really interesting thing about the enlargement project is that it, it speaks to two dimensions of what I understand to be the experimental life of the European Union. One is the original messianic idea that this rescues Europe, right? So we all know that if you look at the main eastward enlargement uh, of the last 15 years, that that was something which was going to happen. It was going to happen, right? It was very, very difficult to have a project which says the European Union is for the whole of Europe, and then say you're not coming, right? It was going to happen. It was going to take quite a long time, but it was going to happen, right? So there's an element of that. So it then becomes, so the, there's, there's a dogma, there's a silent dogma built into that, that's going to happen. But then, of course, what you also get is the other side of it, you know, which is, it's going to happen in a way which is as methodical, as evidence-led as we can. So you have that whole process, that whole rigorous process of, you know, uh, of uh, the various chapters, 
How many chapters is it again that have to be agreed, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, before any country can, can can join? You have many, many countries of cent Central Europe whose whole politics are taken out of shape for many years in the need to conform with these various criteria. So the idea that the political and the scientific in that sense, or that the political and the technocratic are different, I think is, is wrong. I think they actually overlap significantly. And also, again, you see a kind of strange marriage between the dogmatism at the heart of the European project and the way in which that leads towards the use of a certain type of administrative rationality. But I take your point. There is, there is some overstatement there. Yeah. Uh, first of all, thank you for a very interesting lecture. Um, I have a little bit of a critical point about your second bullet point on the slide, because democrat a more democratical response of input legitimacy, it, for me it feels like it implies that the EU is not democratic enough, but if you look at that we actually vote for the European Parliament, that the European Council is actually um, is of our representatives. I, I cannot really understand that point, in, uh, to be honest. And also the second, uh, the first bullet point is about, uh, the, and also in relation with your, one of your first sentences was about that it felt like the European was not ready for uh, a constitution. Oh, well, I will shout that. <laughs> um, that the European Union was not ready for a constitution, but if you look at the current treaties, they are actually the constitution without some aspects in it. In essence, it's the same. We only have not the European song and etc. and the European flag. So, oh, okay. I, I uh, cannot really understand it. I think that maybe it's the wording that makes people yeah. concerned. And I understand, yeah, okay. So let, let me, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's difficult with the, uh, okay, bo both points. The, fir the first is that, uh, look, we could debate until the end of time about how democratic the European Union is. It's, you know, people have different ways of thinking about this. But the, the, I guess the point I would make is, it comes back to my Frankenstein point, okay? That, uh, to the extent that the, the people who use the Frankenstein metaphor, to the extent that they, they have, uh, uh, they have anything to say, which is just an update of the bits and pieces metaphor, actually, you know, but with the, the Frankenstein dimension, you know, thrown in, you know, it, it's uh, the what they're saying is, look, uh, this is an unplanned city, right? This is not planned. This is what happens. You know, this is, you know, this is the. Uh, you know, the, you know, the old joke about a camel is a horse made by committee. You know, this is, uh, this is, this, this is something which happens as a result of a number of raj rational project-specific plans. But what you're left with is something where the remit of the European Union is now so large that actually what we would, what we would require by way of democratic uh, uh, legitimation of that would be very, very broad. And clearly, it would be broad enough to actually stand in tension with our national levels of democracy. And that's part of the problem. It's not, it's not necessarily about the fact that structurally and formally we lack anything in terms of the European Parliament. It's just in terms of how democratic authority is tied up with allegiance and the extent to which people take an interest in their democratic representatives and take them seriously. So even though we have the formal attributes of democracy at the European level, we don't necessarily have the cultural attributes where people actually take that democratic dimension as seriously as they should or they could. So that, that's part of it. Uh, the point about Finality, I have to, it is not insignificant, right? It is not insignificant that the constitutional project failed. And of course, and it's certainly not insignificant that, that it was then almost replaced word by word by the Treaty of Lisbon, right? So, so what that tells us is either that people are fundamentally stupid, which is probably true, or it tells us that something really significant lies in the idea of the symbolism of the Constitution, right? So what, what the Constitution symbolized, or what it seemed to symbolize in a way that people found either dangerous or unattractive or unrealistic, 
was, first of all, it symbolised a kind of hubristic desire to say we're the kind of polity which can have a constitution. There's something, there's something dangerously state-like in that kind of idea that we have a constitution. Yeah, you have another treaty, but please don't call it a constitution, because that sounds like some kind of, of aspiration towards statehood. And secondly, the idea, which just seemed so deeply counterintuitive, but which was within the project that this is a last, this is a last treaty revision. They'll stop after this. You know, it'll all come to an end. And anyone looking at that, and anyone looking at the recent history of the European Union could see that that was not the case. And of course, that's been vindicated, because we've had treaty change since Lisbon. We will have treaty change again, et cetera, et cetera. So that idea that somehow the EU, because if you think of a constitution, a constitution works on the basis that there's a process of change and evolution. And then what you get is some notion of finality, of some deep change which will then structure things from, that, from then on. The way in which you think of the, the EU, if the constitutional treaty had worked and been called a constitutional treaty, it would just have been one more point on the continuum of treaty change. There'd been nothing any more fundamental about it than there would have been about the, the previous treaties or the treaties which followed it. So in that sense, I think the constitutional metaphor is wrong. But I agree with you, substantively, a, a lot of what is said within that covers the material constitution, if you want to call it that, the material constitution is there, it's the same. The symbolic constitution is very different. Um, I think fragility and maturity is a great description of where we are now. Um, but I think the future is more than unsettled. I think yeah. it's highly troublesome. And I think you know your last two, well, the contrast between those two really illustrates that. I don't disagree with it, but I find it highly troubling because what, um, and, and sort of leaving aside what's going to happen in the UK and what it's going to do, but what, it, what is going to happen in the EU post what, and it's of course, Brexit is, is part of a much broader phenomenon um, that we see elsewhere. I'm not saying that it's going to repeat itself or anything like that, but there are definite uh, legitimacy concerns that have come very clearly sure. before. Now, my point is, um, your second point, um, basically, and what you're saying there, I, I think, is that the future is bleak in terms of actually trying to reform in, much, I would argue, much needed respects, um, some of the genuine accountability issues within the European Union as it has evolved. Think, for example, just one example, I happen to be working on the European Central Bank. Yeah. Um, and that is relevant because I agree with you that the future almost certainly will involve more differentiation. Um, but that means that they will just, you know, for example, the, the euro um, will, just, will, will just go ahead um, without any more genuine reform. Um, that I would argue is needed. So, so, you know, that sort of dynamic between decisions to just go ahead and, and also the issue of addressing the relationship between those that are in and those that are out um, is also then that's very much. But I'm not optimistic as to how that would be solved more generally because yeah. I don't think there would be the agreement, you know? Well, so, yeah, thanks. I mean, I... I, I, I <clears throat> look, I mean... What, what, we sh what we have to avoid here, and I'm trying very hard to avoid it, is a kind of like deep fatalism. You know, that, 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 and, and, you know, it's, 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 you know, I mean, I think one of the points that I, I like what you said about Brexit, and I think one of the points we have to remember is that if Brexit had happened 15 years ago, then it would, it would not have the same ripple effects on the European Union. It would always have been a fundamental thing. But one of the reasons it seems fundamental now is that, you know, it's, uh, there are so many examples of structural instability, it seems to add to that, to reinforce it, you know, to, to somehow corroborate the other forms of, of structural instability. On the question of, of coreness, I think, 
it's you know it's a it's an ill wind that blows no one any good. You know, so there there is a sense in which we were talking about this last night. Actually, the the uh, support for the European project has actually gone up in a number of states in the last couple of weeks. <laughs> when you see the fallout in the UK, so they begin people begin to see some of the consequences of of actually. Uh, Unthinking something that you've taken for granted for so many years. And uh, something good might come of that. The second thing I would say is that there's nothing impossible about squaring the circle and finding an optimal relationship between expertise and democracy. It's really hard. It's a really hard thing to do. And the point is, it's something which has to be faced in good faith. And I think part of the problem is we've reached a point in the European political project where that debate isn't, isn't, doesn't take place realistically or in good faith. You know? So many of the people, and this isn't just a UK phenomenon, many of the people who say, you know, uh, we can't have any more of these experts in Brussels telling us what to do, would be the first people to complain about any new constitutional structures which would further empower the European Parliament or any other representatives of European democracy. Now, that is either ignorance or bad faith, or both. But it's what has happened. It's what happens when a political project becomes illegible, when people don't understand it anymore. Or it's what happens when some people feel like that and other people can exploit that feeling. It may well be that there is part of Europe, and it may be a smaller or larger part of Europe, which doesn't necessarily have to fall into that state of bad faith with the European project. You know, it may well be, and I think some of the, uh, some of the initiatives with the initial six immediately afterwards, some of the other things which have come out in the last few days, et cetera, et cetera, rather suggest you know, that there are other people who think, look, these are, th this is a genuine set or political problems which can be faced honestly and legibly, rather than something to which we are, it's some fate to which we are, we are necessarily assigned. But I agree with you, it's, 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 it's difficult to see the way ahead. Thank you very much, Neil. I think we'd better uh, bring this session to a close so that uh, everyone has time for a breather and we let, let, uh, let, Neil, let Neil go after a, after a long and full session. But I'd like to Thank you again for a fantastic lecture, really, really interesting and, and thought-provoking and uh, a good discussion afterwards. So thank you to the audience as well. Thank you.